It's not the one of five, so I guess I should start. For those that don't know, I'm Steve Rosted. I work for Red Hat. Uh, I work for their MRG um, division, which is SG Real Time Grid. Uh, I work on the R part, the real time part. Uh, I'm also the, the stable the maintainer for the real time stable releases. Um, and I also do various other things. Um, back in 2007, at the Ottawa Linux Symposium, OLS, I gave a talk about the uh, inside the RT patch. This is a slide I had with Darren Hart, who came up and did a benchmark. Uh, ELC, uh, earlier this year, I think it was in April, I didn't know what ELC was, uh, it was in San Francisco. Uh, Someone came up to me, I, was, I presented about a uh, little facility I wrote called K-Test, that's one of the tests of the people. And, um, and some people upset with me saying, well, why didn't you talk about real time? Like, what do you mean? He said, well, you haven't talked about real time in a long time. A lot of people don't know what real time has. We know of it. We kind of know it does some magical stuff, but we don't know what's inside it. You do your talk again that you gave at OLS. So I said, sure. Um, they said, you do an update version. So um, I'm like, okay. So I went around and I found my OLS talk. And I'm like, what do you go look at it? Well, I guess they should update it. Oh, really fast. <laughs> yeah. That was messed up. That was my update. Okay. New board. <laughs> there, I did the, the, so now I got a new updated presentation. The other one was ugly. Uh, this one else. But things, I don't want, you know, inside the RT patch, like, oh, that's kind of a boring name. Let's, you know, update that. Understanding pronounce RT. Now, I mean, moving ahead. But things have changed. For example, Darren Hart doesn't work for IBM anymore. He works for Intel. But we don't care, because he's not going to be part of this presentation. Unless <laughs> 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 he wants to come up with that. <coughs> so where do you get the real-time patch? Um, you know, I post up here the stable repositories in a Git repository. Uh, we have several branches. Um, where I maintain 3.0, RT, 3.2RT, 3.4RT. RT, 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 RT. Soon, when Tuos goes to the next release, I'll be maintaining 3.6RT. The way, how long, you ask me how long you're going to maintain it. Basically, I just call whatever the, main, uh, the uh, what's called mainline releases. So as long as Redbar Hartman maintains 3.0 and 3.4, I'll maintain the RT version on top of 3.0 and 3.4. Uh, ben Hutchinson is doing 3.2 for Debian. He asked me if I could do an RT patch for him. I said, sure. So I, so I maintain the 3.2 as well. As long as they maintain it, I'll maintain it. So that's where it leads. Once they stop maintaining it, I'm stopping maintaining it there. Like, when 3.0 is done by Greg Hartman, I'm done with the old RT as well. Um, the patches are underneath this directory there. You know, like I posted, I finally sent my email to uh, uh, Steve Craig Ross, and uh, this would be up at the LX Foundation, so you can find these things up there. Uh, we have a wiki. Go ahead. It, I think people are not updating it now. I don't know why I haven't looked at it. So, so what is a real-time operating system? Now, this is one thing. People always just, like think it's a like, fast operating system. I've had so many pieces um, where I, I was in uh, one company in Germany. I'm not going to mention the name. It's just kind of like a General Electric in Germany. Uh, and one of the managers was like, I can't, can't wait to see this kernel. It's going to see how fast it is. No, <laughs> it doesn't. I, I really just wish they don't call it a real time operating system. I really wish they call it a deterministic operating system. DOS. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, real time means it does what you expect it to do. You can calculate it, you can know, you do calculations and say, you know, when this happens, I can guarantee that this will work. Okay? You can, basically, there's no surprises. That's what a real time system is. It does not mean stacks. But that said, we need not through it. Because it's really a useless machine <laughs> if it doesn't get you anywhere. If you can't keep up with, like right now I know a lot of the uh, New York Stock Exchanges uses real-time Linux, but they want fast throughput. They also want um, deterministic results. So they need both, speed and deterministic. So that's like the kind of a thing that we play where it's kind of hard to balance that. Because the, you know, the more deterministic we get, we keep adding overhead. But we try to cut that. We find tricks to get around with things so we get really good throughput as well. And sometimes we find so good tricks that we can improve mainline's performance. But sometimes we can probably make it faster than mainline, and the mainline says, oh, we should use this as well. Then they can faster than us. So real time has always been this thing that helps the mainline Linux. We've done so much, we've cleaned up the mainline Linux because we need mainline to be clean and 
fast and reliable to make uh, the real-time part work. So we are constantly sending stuff upstream. Um, but the whole point is, you know, it can make your deadlines. Now, real-time operating system, just for people that, if you do uh, real-time work, you have to really understand what you're, it's not just the operating system, it's also the um, uh, user space. Your user space processes have to understand real-time. Your hardware has to be real-time compliant. You're getting cash misses like left and right or stuff, or contention on the bus. You're going to have these spikes that you're, you have to be prepared for. You have to, you have to basically have that be deterministic as well. So everything in your system has to be deterministic to have a truly deterministic system. And so you have to do your homework. So what's the goal of the preempt RT? Uh, basically, we're trying to become a kernel that's 100% preemptive. And that's impossible. But we're going to try anyway. Uh, because to have response times, you can't be anywhere to a place where the system won't respond. So you have to be able to respond anywhere in the kernel. So we're trying, we, we do a lot of things to the kernel, and I'll talk about that before this talk. Um, to have our quick responses, now we also want um, timing interrupts to be bad, like build say we go off at this point, we can't just be like, what, go off once every millisecond. Uh, so we added, you know, the HR timers, the uh, high resolution timers was added from the real-time patch for the selection. So that's like basically our goal. And by the way, the talk here is more about learning about what the real-time patch is all about. So it's more, I'm, a lot of the stuff, most of you probably know, but some of you may not. Uh, when you apply the real-time patch, and eventually hopefully when this is the mainline, uh, if you go into the processor types of you know, open up the main menu config, and then you go processor type of features, which I don't really understood the processor, but it's not really a processor type of feature, but it's, I think it's underneath that label. Uh, then there's a uh, preemption model, and you'll see a bunch of things, and down at the bottom is where you select that, that gives you the full real-time capabilities. And we'll go um, over to that. One thing I want to say, if you want full real-time capabilities, also go to kernel debugging, you basically turn off almost everything while you're on the production system. <laughs> That could also call some latencies as well. So first, the first thing on that menu was no preemption. I'm going to go quickly over this. This is something because actually I found some kernel developers actually more like driver layers. They didn't really understand what preemption was. And you know, no preemption is usually what you select if you're on a server that doesn't care about fast users, or just you want throughput. You want things to be fast. You can serialize things, batch jobs, and <coughs> batch them. But that's when you want a server. You don't want, when, when you go to the kernel, you don't want to be stopped. You just go, finish the job, and come out, and let everyone else wait. Um, it doesn't actually always mean it's the fastest either. It could cause things to die a lot. But actually, it's one of the nice things that are, one of the properties of no prediction is over. But no one actually ever, I don't know if anyone actually selects this. All the distributions don't do, well, I think there was one distribution that still had no prediction is over. A lot of them use the voluntary <coughs> Uh, voluntary preemption selection, basically, uh, there's these things you'll see like white sleep throughout the kernel. And what white sleep was was a way to debug the preemptible kernel. And because there's times where you can't you can't schedule when you're in non preemption areas. So there's a way to get the single preemption in the normal angle of the kernel. You can't call schedule. So what we do is we have places that we say it. We know that if someone calls this function, this function might call schedule. There's a path that will call it schedule. So at the beginning of the function, we put the same white sleep in there. So if we call this function from a non from a non preemptible section, the white sleep will say, "Hey, bug here! You know, you just call the function from a non preemptible section, and this function might call schedule, and that could break things. So don't do that." But this also has another side effect because everywhere we have white sleep, it's telling you you can schedule this function might schedule. So why not if like Something happens and an interrupt comes in, and you wake up a task, and you hit a white sleep, why not schedule? So when you hit voluntary preemption, it uses this debugging trick to say, hey, we just hit a white sleep, we can schedule, we are, we are allowed to schedule right now, let's schedule. So every place is a little spot in the kernel for white, with like these little white sleep things here. When you have voluntary preemption, you get a little bit better response time, but it's not full preemption, it's just at these preemption points that say, it's okay to schedule here. So if we need a schedule opportunity, do it. Uh, the preemptible kernel is, you know, Robert Love came up with, I guess, the development of the 2.6 kernel, 2.24 and 2.6, he came up with um, the preemptible kernel. And the whole idea about the preemptible kernel was the fact that we have spin locks that was made to make everything, we added spin locks to make everything work with SP. So we can say, hey, we're in this, we're in this area of the code, we've got to protect it from a CPU being in that same area. So we put a spin lock around it. So if 
this guy tries to get to this area, where this, where this CPU is in this uh, area, this guy comes around, hits the spin lock, hits spin, and waits for him to finish. Well, but you can also say, hey, if we have a unit processor system, we can say we can schedule everywhere, because it kind of makes the unit processors with full preemption kind of simulates a SMP processor. And so when you hit spin lock, we just disable preemption and just go, and then we have spin unlock combo. So Robert Love's idea was just make, when you grab spin lock, you stop preemption. And then uh, enable preemption will have to spin lock. And they actually work pretty well. And now we actually have almost a fully preemptible kernel, a much more preemptible kernel in mainline because of this. <coughs> but there's a lot of things where you can personally do stuff where you don't want to be scheduled out and migrated and stuff. So we have areas where we actually have a function called preempt disable, and it'll actually stop preemption in this point without spin lock. Uh, with a non preemptible kernel or voluntary preemptible kernel, preempt disable is a low on because we can't, we can't um, preempt anyway there. Now, you'll notice know, like, you can see like preempt RT base, and you'll see in, in the preemptive kernel basic RT. Don't worry about this option. Uh, it basically is way, Thomas Weichmann's way of saying, uh, I want to add everything into the kernel that is like from the real, full real time batch, but I don't want to do the full switch yet. This way I get the bug fix. See, as he said, I think he said, uh, the build to test half the list. So don't worry about this one option. Let's see you want to play with it. Say, hey, give me a little bit of the about the real time kernel kind of scares me. But this, may, this option is go away. Because this is what we really want. When you add the full real time preemption, this is where we try to preempt everywhere. We preempt inside spin lines. So, that, that makes things kind of weird. So spin, spin locks are now mutexes. Interrupts now have to be threads because you can't, from an when interrupt goes off, the interrupt handler, you can't schedule from an interrupt handler because uh, it has no context. It's whatever context that it just preempted. And if you were to schedule off an interrupt handler and you were in a task that was preempted, and that task was scheduled away for a long time, that interrupt is gone for a long time as well. So you can't schedule out interrupt handlers. So unless it was a thread. So when an interrupt goes off, you wait for the thread, now you can't schedule out. So but the reason why we have to do this first was because there's a bunch of spin locks inside the kernel threads, and now spin locks are mutexes, that means they're might sleep, so they're going to sleep, so we have to be able to sleep or, or call schedule from the interrupt handler. We also added priority inheritance, and I'll talk about that as well. Now, sleeping spin locks. When you have uh, normal config preempts, the, the, in the main line, the most preemptible way you have, a uh, spin lock just spins, and it's a safe And any time you disable preemption, I call that the BKL for the CPU, the, CPU. Um, the big kernel lock. Because once you disable preemption, you are the highest priority process in the system. No one else can preempt you. No one else, you are, nothing will stop you. You run forever. You're the boss, you're the hog. And it really is, that's just kind of like the big hail. Everyone hated it. We were so happy and we cheered, but we got rid of it. Uh, so, to us, it's a um, global lock, so we want to sleep. So, what we do is we kind of contain it. Instead of containing it to the CPU, we contain it to the task, or any task that needs to get into this critical section. So, this critical section of code is what is not contained. So, there's a lock around this critical section of code that multiple tasks will have to share to get in and out. So, there is a delay there, so if you're doing timings, you if you have to look at the kernel, you have to look at the biggest places between uh, where locks are that your process might call and determine that's going to be a latency there. But, but because it might be blocked in something else. But that's all actually <coughs> we create that automatically enables certain neurons. And uh, yeah, oh we, we can't also spin locks cannot be where we have where you just when you manually or what's it called uh, out of line, do a disable interrupts or disable preemption. You can't call spin line in these little areas uh, because it's good. And then we also have priority inheritance. Right now, priority inheritance is this in mainline kernel, but it's only for few tests. So, or if you, have, if you do like a PI mutex, or yeah, sorry, P thread, a P thread mutex with the PI attribute, like P thread IO attribute, we call it, or P that's like that. Uh, you actually can have your threads in user space have priority inheritance. Uh, but that's not in the kernel. But when we enable full preemption, all the spin locks and mutexes within the kernel get this uh, priority inheritance as well. So, what is priority inheritance? Now, priority inversion is whenever you have one task running that's a lower priority than the task that wants to run. And this happens all the time. You can't stop it. The real time kernel has priority inversion. Uh, it's just the way life is. 
but we don't want unbounded IRE inversion. Uh, that is something that we have to stop. Now we have one way, the way we solve it is through priority inheritance. There's other ways of solving it that we go into that. But there's a priority inheritance is the way we make it. But one of the complaints about the priority inheritance is its complexity. And yes, it's really complex. No reason why we got priority inheritance in the curl is I wrote this nice big thing. If you look into documentation, it'll be like RT text design or something like that. And it explains our algorithm to in gory details. Because Andrew Martin asked me, he's like, so is it like three people that know and understand this code? You know, if you three are together on a plane and it goes down, are we all screwed? <laughs> so I said, if I documented, would you actually accept it? And he said, sure. So I wrote this documentation, pulled in, and shortly after, Andrew was like, yeah, pulled in. You know, so, so it's a, this is complex. So also, it means that we can only have one or block on one owner at a time. So all blocks have to have one owner. Uh, we have tried doing multiple owners, and it makes things even more exponentially more complex. So that's why we hate RWLOX, and I'll talk about that later. So I'm about a priority inversion. Uh, just for people that don't really know, or, you know, this is the basic 101 class of the, the, the example. Say so you have three tasks, A, B, and C. A is the highest priority, B is the second priority, C is the last priority. C is moving along, and it has a lock, and it's preempted by A. So A uh, immediately preempts C, it starts running. But it tries to grab the same block as C has. So now it has a wait for C. So it goes back and lets C run. In the meantime, B wakes up and starts running. And it preempts C. But by preempting C, B has now preempted A. Now we have a prior, you know, this is actually a priority inversion, but it's bounded. This we know it's still the lock we found. But right now, B came up and now we go forever. And this is called an unbounded priority inversion because there's no, we can't tell how long B is going to run or any process is going to run, and C, as long as C is waiting to run, A has to wait, and A's eyes are already process the best. So what priority inheritance gives us is when A blocks on the lock owned by C, C will inherit the priority of A. So now C is running at the priority of A, and when B wakes up, is B is lower priority than A, and C inherited the priority of A, it won't get scheduled. C continues to run. Once C releases a lot, it loses its priority. Right away schedules A, A continues, A's done, C is not being a run. But so this is a bounded priority inversion. And this is acceptable. This is uh, a lot of the time. So it's teaching this up. <laughs> but there's sometimes that, there's some parts that we have spin locks inside the kernel that have to be spin locks um, inside the scheduler. We can't schedule within the scheduler. Actually, we can't. Like, well, the whole point is scheduling, but you know, when you're preempting the scheduler, that's the really bad things can happen. Uh, so, you, know, you can schedule forever, get into a loop. Oh, you'll schedule, 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 schedule. Never finish your schedule. So, uh, some spin locks have to be maintained spin locks. In the old day, and actually, this is some of the slides that I read about from 2007. In the old days, we had this magical way of all you have to do is declare a spin lock as a raw spin lock. And all the spin lock functions turned into this non mutex function. It would always be a raw spin lock. Or if you didn't do that declare, it was it would turn into a mutex spin lock. So looking at the code, we see spin lock to X. You have no idea if you could sleep there or not. <laughs> Mainline people didn't like that. So I uh, hated it as well. Yeah, I know. I did like, oh, I hated looking at it. I, I remember writing in 2007, writing the slides and having to document that crap. <laughs> it was horrible. But the uh, so we we all sat down and like we need to call it a new lock. So we were trying to like what should we call this new lock? Should we call it a live lock? No, maybe a dead lock. No. <laughs> Put in a few dead locks here. We we all sat down like what about golden locks? Um, but anyway, uh, we came down like why don't we just say okay everything that's near real lock is going to be called a wall spin lock. Everything else is going to be a hollow spin lock. So throughout the kernel, you'll see raw spin locks. In today's kernel, we actually have raw spin lock and normal spin locks. That in the mainline kernel, are almost meaning, they're basically the same thing. They're meaningless. Uh, thank you, Linus, for lending us this. Because what it does to help when we apply the real-time patch, it actually shrunk the real-time patch. Because we don't actually have to go through and say, this needs to be a real spin lock, this needs to be a real spin lock, this needs to be a real spin lock. That's in mainline. 
that we mark these things as real spin marks. And then we apply the real time patch. Those are the ones that will stay normal. Regular spin marks are switched to new types of spin. And also, when you look at the code, you know that this spin lock, you'll know right away whether that's a sleeping spin lock or a normal well, spin lock that will always be a true spin lock. Um, and places like uh, timer interrupts, timer interrupts always have to be uh, into inner colors, and timer interrupts do grab spin locks, and that's going to be raw spin locks. So that's where you place the raw spin locks has to be, um, what's it called? Usually you put it in a place that will have parents to say what interrupts to say But try not to add them, because when you add them, you just defeat the purpose of the real time patch. So you try to, be, try to remove as many uh, raw spin locks as possible, and only use them when they're absolutely necessary. Uh, thread interrupts. Thread interrupts. Now, lower is what we call interrupt latency. I always call I, I, my little prosthetism is uh, I call it interrupt conversion, where the interrupt is actually is um, stopping or preventing a high priority process from running. So if you have a low priority process that takes an interrupt, a true interrupt, and a high priority process wakes up and wants to run this, low is this interrupt is doing device doing your hard drive, writing, reading, writing your hard drive, taking maybe microseconds, you know, or no, sorry, milliseconds to do its work. You know, there are there were interrupts that actually were that big you know, for a while there, and uh, that would screw things up. For there's a, that's an inversion, priority errors or priority inversion because you have a low priority process handling or interrupt handling a low priority process and this high priority process that wants to run but can't because the interrupt is running. So making it to threads, you know, you don't want to like update. Ever have update DB go off and your system just slow down to a halt? Well, with this it doesn't happen. So the way like normally I say you have a task, interrupt goes off. Runs the device handler, and then when it's done, and this whole time you can't schedule up. You're, you're basically you gotta wait until this is done. What thread interrupt does, we still actually we still actually have a hard inter like interrupt goes off, and hardware will call something, and that's the priority. And that's there's gonna be the time where it's going to have to run. But this is a deterministic time, so we can know that we can still blip. All it does is wake up the thread, and then you, and then the task is a higher priority process than the interrupt thread. It will finish running. When it finally decides to sleep, then it will wake up the device handler thread, and then it will run. Now, sometimes we still, I always said, like, you know, some <coughs> hard interrupts have to stay hard. Um, the timer interrupt, because the timer interrupt is usually with the schedule. You got to make sure that that's always uh, um, stays as a hard interrupt. You can't make that a threat. We tried it, and it does it kind of screws things up. And when you so when you do your interrupts, you pass the flag, you know, like uh, IRP timer. So that tells us not to turn this into a threat. And we also put that flag no threat. Uh, but don't know, like, so don't be like your device is the most important thing. I want this in hard mode and I'm always put no threat. So they would piss off you, especially if you have spin box for your numbers. But threat interrupts are in mainline today. This is not part of the RT patch. It's in mainline. So, yes. Uh, it first got in as per device. So you can actually have your device say, I'm going to, I want my device to be a thread because I want to run mutexes. I want to take my time. This really uh, interrupt tries to be as small and quick as possible because, you know, even in mainline, they know that as long as you're going to interrupt, not every else, the whole system comes to a stop to that CPU until this interrupt is done. And people like that, people get upset by that. That's, you know, like, update the beams, so your system makes your system very jittery. You don't want that. So, so like, let's make it a thread, and, I get, and it makes your device driver, I can relax more. I don't have to think about all these crazy ideas that make the, the, my interrupt are so, so small, and pass it a grab box to set these to queues, and pass off to something else, the software queue, the one later. No, you don't have to do all that. You can just say, um, I'm going to run my handler as a thread. Now, if your device is a shared device, which means that you can share the interrupt line. Say if you have two or three devices, or if you're like, this device can't, is allowed to share an interrupt line. <coughs> well, you have to get, if you want a threaded interrupt, you have to have a way to disable your device. So when an interrupt calls, you can pass it a function say, when an interrupt happens, call this function, and this will shut down the device so the interrupt line can stay on. So you don't want to turn off the interrupt line if there's two or three other devices that are sharing it. So when you have the device driver thread, you can wake up, say, shut down my device, and then you go off and run, and then it will wake up your thread, your thread will call, it will call a separate function to do the actual work. Um, if you're not a shared, you know, for, for some reason your device doesn't allow to share, share, you don't need to do that. You can just say, I want to thread an interrupt, but I can't share. Because I know I'm the only one on this interrupt line, just shut down the interrupt line. I don't have to share all the device. It's sometimes quicker that way. So when the interrupt goes off, it just says, okay, mass this one interrupt line, wake up the thread, go off. When your thread's done running, it will enable the interrupt line. <coughs> um, 
So per device this time is still preferred because you have shared devices. That's, when you don't have shared devices, everything's got to be run on one thread. You can't prioritize your device among the other devices that are shared on the same interrupt line. So if you have a device that has its own interrupt thread, that's preferable if you can do it that way because then you can get the priority of that device and not for all the devices on that interrupt thread. Um, but if you're not shared, you don't need it because you're one interrupt line. Because when we turn on the big switch, which is also a main line, uh, I'll talk about that. All interrupts, um, everything that's, uh, all your devices become interrupt uh, friends. So how do you do this? Request threaded hierarchy. That's how you do it. There's a couple parameters. You tell the driver says, I want my interrupt as a thread. Uh, there's two functions, the handler. This is the handler that gets called on the interrupt, hard interrupt. So you put it, you pass your handler. If it's small, it, you must have a threaded interrupt. And what it will do, it will assign a default, is a default uh, function that uh, the kernel, the interrupt system will uh, do for you. Um, so if it's uh, not in all, it'll be called, this function is called by the hard interrupt. <coughs> and your function is called in. And um, this. So say if you, how do you make a mainline today? You want all your interrupts as threads. What do you do? You, on the command line, prop, uh, command line, you just put in threaded, or yeah, thread IRPs. And you do it and it will, this will actually force everything to be interrupt. And all it does basically, it will, um, the system uses the normal, it doesn't add any functions. It just sets a flag that makes everyone use that, kind of like the, the request IRQ, the threaded IRQ, the re, what's it called, the request threaded IRQ is called by everyone anyway. It's just an always passed in saying that this is not going to be a thread, there's like no thread in handler, just a hard handler. But this, what this will do, it will swap around uh, when you put thread IRQ, it will swap it for you. It will swap the function, the thing I said is my handler, becomes the thread handler instead. It does all work for you. Right. Yeah. Local IRQ to see. Evil. Don't use it. Uh, a lot of times, like when we were doing our video, like, you know, in the beginning of real time, we noticed that most device drivers were extremely bugged on SMP because they were still in the mindset that I can disable interrupts and nothing will ever get into this code again. Not realize that another CPU could be running around and into that same code and calling crashes. So don't use low power IQ, say, especially if I, I have to turn off my, drill, I, or my device, so let me disable the interrupt. Well, if you're a shared device, you just disable all other devices and interrupts. It's just a bad thing to use. Just try not to use it. Causes high latencies. If you possible, try to get rid of your low power IQ saves. Use spin lock IQ save. If you have a lot that you want, you can use spin lock IQ save. And because the preempt RT, we don't disable interrupts. The, the in, uh, preempt RT, spin lock, spin lock IRQ, spin lock IRQ save, they're all the same thing. It's just a mutex. They're actually a special mutex, I'm not going to talk about that. So, <coughs> low latency. And another nice thing about putting spin locks, one thing I don't like about low power IRQ disable is the fact you don't know why you disable interrupts. When you're looking at someone's code and you say low power IRQ disable, it's like, why do they disable interrupts? So, those are a nice comment there. And it's like, what do they protect? It, sometimes it baffles us. Uh, when you have a spin lock with a uh, name on it, you actually kind of you look at the name and say, oh, this lock is protecting this data here. And you actually search for that lock and find other places like, okay, how could things get into this critical section? So uh, spin locks actually give a name to what you're kind of protecting, which is a good, you know, this is a hint to determine why this is there. Helps you buggy. Grant disable is basically, I call the low power IQ's younger brother, with buggy or simply. It also doesn't give any hints to why, you, why are you not disabling here? Uh, what's going on? Why do you disable this? It doesn't give any needs. Um, also, there's another little thing. Every so often you'll see print enable will be said. Because whenever you do print disable, when you do a print enable, it checks to see if a interrupt happened. Because print disable doesn't stop interrupts. Because interrupt could not <coughs> wake something up, set a flag saying, we need to schedule now, but we're, you said don't print right now, so I'm going to wait. When you do a preempt enable, it checks that flag. If that flag's set, then it goes and calls schedule. Uh, there's some cases where you don't want to call schedule. For example, you might say preempt enable schedule. If you're calling schedule right after a preempt enable, there's a function for that. Oh, you're right. There is a function for that now. What's it called again? Uh, schedule preempt disabled or something like that. Yeah. Look, there's actually, yeah, that's right. There, that's right. I forgot about that. I should have been. No, I just finished my slides this morning. <laughs> I was going to have, I've only had 10 hours of sleep since I've been here. For three nights, total. 
Um, yeah, there's, there's actually a function. So actually, perhaps actually I should change my slides and say, don't ever call print the name of reset because I think you're right. I think we have a function for every time that this section is amazing. I'm going back to the old days when we actually had to search these because when we put these in, there's no preemption check. We call this um, uh, like preemption leak. Because say somebody woke up and said, okay, schedule one right away. Oh, preempt disabled. They do preempt enable, no reset, which means it doesn't check to see if anything happened. Now you're going on in a preemptible section, but you didn't preempt because the system didn't know or forgot about this wake up that happened, and you go on for a long time, and then you see this huge latency spike and say, what the hell, what is this thing? And like, you're looking at everything like, well, it's, you're looking at your code, and like, well, wait a minute, I don't understand, this is all preemptible code. Why did this guy wake up? And then you find, oh, someone called print and they said, don't hear, don't hear music. Percy view variables. Now, I think that SMP is you know, becoming big. Everyone's focusing on SMP, so I would say that you know, Percy view is the way to go because sharing um, variables across multiple nodes is expensive. You know, cache frame balancing and all this stuff. Um, so a lot of people like Percy view. Unfortunately, Percy view is horrible for like, kind of real time because the way you protect Percy view a lot of times is you disable preemption. So you can do all your stuff with the, uh, this, this Percy view variable and then enable preemption. And you can do this for long periods of time and that really screws us over, and we understand why you're doing it, we're like, we're like oh, how can we fix this? So, I mean, try not to do it uh, with the right to say that disable. Maybe we keep it get CPU bar, that kind of, or get CPU, that, that kind of uh, makes it good for us. Now, one thing you can do is you can pin the CPU thread. If you just want to use the or so you can use the pin CPU thread and say, okay, we're going to use the CPU, but I, I know this thread always stays on the CPU, so I don't have to worry about migration. Um, we added a new call called get CPU light. In, main, or in real time on this, this is this not mainline to Linux call, but it will start, hopefully when we get our code into mainline, you'll see get CPU light. What it does is, it doesn't disable preemption, it disables migration. The thread is now, it automatically pins your thread to that CPU. So you say get CPU light, but you need to protect that, you have to protect that variable from if you migrate out, migrate in. Um, and it makes sure that the CPU is not going away. Oh, yes. Well, I thought, isn't there some actual stuff that be able to do that for you? Or not yet? What? Is there any actual stuff that, that, like, you know, when the CPU is about to go down, or you know, when the CPU is already going down, don't use it? Yeah, then it's ignored anyway because you're you're running into into the, hey, the CPU is not there anymore. Yeah, yeah. So basically, if you're doing hot plug CPU, which is, we hate hot plug CPU. That's one of these, like, we do isolation CPUs and just like, make that CPU shut down by itself while doing actually a true hot plug. That would actually be better. But if you do like a hot plug CPU where you say, turn this, take the CPU down, but there's a thread that jumps on it and it's migrated or locked, where basically you pinned your CPU onto a thread or onto a CPU that's actually disappearing, bad things can happen. So, uh, get local var. Uh, that's a bit of a Yeah, actually, I think I talked about it. So, get CPU light. Uh, on non preempt, it's exactly the same as get CPU. Uh, on the preempt RT, it's the same as migration. Like I said, it could be scheduled out, and somebody else could be scheduled on that CPU, so it's, it's not protecting the variable on the CPU, but at least you have voice access to this variable uh, when, when, you, uh, so when you grab the get CPU, you always have access to you know that you're always going to be on that CPU. As long as that CPU is not going to disappear. Then you're going to be migrating on that. Um, Get CPU var. Oh, that's right. This is get CPU is just if you want to associate a variable with what you're doing get CPU for. That's actually get CPU var is nice because you know why you're uh, get CPU is like I said. You look at get CPU. There's no name attached to it, so you have to figure out why did they just do the get CPU? What what are they doing here? When you get CPU var, you actually say, oh, this person's using this per CPU variable, uh, so it helps you. Local lock. We have local lock, local lock IRQ, local IRQ, lock IRQ save. On um, preempt RT, it's just a disabled, uh, preempt disabled, nothing else. No, it, it, the, the IRQ variant actually disabled the drop. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're, you're right. Yeah. Um, I, I only went to the local lock version and I forgot what's right this time. So if you do the local lock IRQ, it disables uh, interrupts. If you do local lock IRQ save, you have to pass the flags, and it's just a, like a local. It's, you basically use the Use this type of thing instead of using uh, local IRQ save. Use local lock IRQ save. That's okay. Uh, in mainline, it's, it's just like you disable interrupts when you cram some real time kernel. It doesn't disable interrupts, but you actually are, you grab a spin or you grab a mutex instead. So it will grab a mutex for that variable and it pins your 
tasks to that CPU. So sales migration, grabs the mutex, and now you have um, protect that earlier data that you're using is now protected um, from re-entrance. You know, if you get migrated off, or not migrated, if you get scheduled out, somebody else just schedules in and goes to the same path, you don't grab the mutex and your, your variable is protected. So, earlier you mentioned spin lock IRPs. Yeah. Here we have local IRPs. Oh, the difference is, well, local IRPs. Well, the local lock is basically a, a, a macro magic, which you give it a name. And if you're not on fully preemptive curl, it just turns into either preempt disable or IRQ save or IRQ disable. And on premium or T it actually creates a lock for you and takes the lock. So you or changing let's say you have this section of code where you have local IQ safe and local IQ restore. It's changing that protection, which is totally valid for pure CPU stuff. Um, it changes that protection <coughs> by placing a lock around that critical section. So on RT you bet you you actually take a lock. So, so the, the, the thing is why we do, don't, don't use spin locks at that point because we actually want to, to, to merge that code at some point to, to the main line. And the local lock substitution which will allow the non-RT people to just use their known mechanisms is a pretty nice way not to impact them with locks. Right, so basically to sum up what Thomas just said, uh, local lock IRQ variants is basically we said don't use back here. I said don't use local IRQ save. There was our local IRQ save all the place. We say replace that with local lock IRQ save. And then just put a name to it. Because in other words there's no in mainline there's no lock. I think you also said though replace local IRQ save with spin lock. Spin lock. Well no, okay, the idea is well actually local lock IRQ save is is exactly that. But on main but Some people don't want to actually add a lock. Right. Right. They don't want to. They don't. I don't want to put a lock. Spin lock IR, you say, was always as a spin. Yes. Local IR, you say, as a spin lock on our team. Right. What do you do? The local lock variant. Local yeah. lock variant. Creates and the only on our team. Yeah. And yeah. Um, the spin lock IR group will create the spin lock always. The nice thing about it, uh, and I think that's how I can sell it upstream is that it actually gives a name to the section you're protecting. Right. So local IQ safe and local IQ restore is not giving any information about what you, the hell you're protecting. With, with adding a named entity to it, you actually describe what you're trying to protect. So it's, it's more for, for non-RT, it's more of a documentation value. Right. So in, um, in non-RT, People use low IRQ disable. When you look at it, you have this bullet right here. No inclination to what is protecting. You can name, put a name to your local lock. Your local IRQ, what we're saying is label your local IRQ. So you give it a name. It gives an idea of what your a hint to what you're protecting. But in, that's what we're telling mainline. Stop just putting this blind. I have no idea. This is confuses people in mainline. So I, I, there's several times where I'm like, where I'm saying, why is this? I can't figure out why this local IRQ disables here or this grant disables here. Why did you do that? And the thing is, I forgot. <laughs> but it works. <laughs> and it breaks if you remove it. Yes. <laughs> this happens a lot. And I'm like, by giving you a way of documenting it, it actually will help normal developers. Oh, now I remember why I did this. They actually have a name to it. It's like this blind, there's a lock here. Or this, I disabled it on subscription. So that's the whole purpose of uh, the reason why this is basically naming. What all we're saying is put a name to your local bar IQ disable. Um, so that's a local lock IQ disable. Maybe we could call it, maybe we should put a name to the bar. Uh, local or local IQ bar. I don't know if you want what name, but local lock IQ disable. Local lock IQ save. Name your reason why you're disabling those. And for real time, we can actually convert that. We give it a lock. So, they, they don't care about real time, but we do, and it helps us. And actually, some people are like, okay, I'll help you, I'll do this this time. It actually helps mainline as well because stuff gets documented. We, we recently removed the preempt disable section in, in the mainline, which was just redundant because those developers put the lock into there. Yeah. 
And everybody forgot about the prions disabled, and it actually turned out to be imbalanced. They never executed the error code path, but we did. So, RW locks, we hate them. Uh, they're really horrible things. Uh, they don't. They do cache line bouncing, and they do a lot of stuff. But they're also deaf to deter, uh, de determinism. Uh, a reader, right, when you have multiple readers, you know how many readers you have in a writer blocks. That um, the the critical section is, you know, O to the N length, where N is the number of readers you have. So if you have 50 readers, 100 readers, that critical set, that writer could, if they're all just entered you know, on like 50 CPUs, and all these readers entered at the same time, those critical connections, just as a writer will have one by that period, they had to wait for every one of these guys. And so it's... It was actually even worse was yeah. until your last year, because once a reader was in the section, a writer could be blocked infinitely by other readers coming in yes. while he was waiting. Right. And so now, okay, that's right. So what we did, or at the time, like a writer come in, a reader comes in, another reader comes in, another reader comes in, and as readers <coughs> come in, this writer just sits there wait. But now it's a FIFO, right? Yes. <coughs> now it's a FIFO block. And therefore it's prone to deadlocks. We now have deadlocks that didn't exist anymore. Because the idea of a rewrite writer lock was a reader doesn't block on a reader. <coughs> So you can have a, you know, grab block A, grab block B, reader, grab for read A, grab for read B. And it's always supposed to be grab for read B, grab for read A. The simple priority or the deadlock, you know, A, B, B, A, blocking block. No big deal. Readers don't block on readers. So you go on. Throw a writer in there. Now, reader grabs block A, and and I'll list you, reader grabs slot B. A writer comes in to grab those things and blocks on uh, reader A. Now the next, or say if reader B comes in, or that's right, grabs slot A. <laughs> it's, it's actually very, it's very, very confusing because that's why it's really hard to explain this. B A. What? I know, but please, I, hope, I, I do need a slide on this. I know, right. Basically, once the writer's in there, the next reader that comes in will walk on it. That's right. So if you grab B or grab A, it goes in, a writer comes in and tries to grab A. Um, now we have to have yes. B, which holds right, B, B yep. tries to grab A and deadlocks. Right. So we have now B comes in and comes across A. <coughs> So basically, the reader will not block on the other guys. And now a reader could actually block on another reader because the writer's in the next thing is playful. So right, as, because readers have to block, like, wait for the writer. If the writer goes onto a block or goes onto a lock onto the queue, the readers have to wait for it. So it blocks the block. So now readers block, which means that a deadlock is not possible. This is mainline today. So we have to try. Oh. No, I guess I think we that, found uh, actually two of them. Yeah, and uh, no, I think so, Peter's, is it Peter working on detecting us now? Yeah, well, we, uh, Peter is working on adding uh, detection for that yeah. scenario to lock step. Because before it wasn't, it just had uh, this we, scenario. Just but we triggered so two of them in RT. Yeah, so RT has triggered two of the step ones. So, because what we do in, what we do in RT, as I said, multiple, I mean, Priority inheritance for multiple owners is extremely difficult. Um, we just say we just say, okay, all readers are a single mutex. So all readers are all readers. So you can't have two readers in two, but we actually uh, and this really kills things like the MAPSM. Uh, so uh, because that's actually a mutex and it's, a, it's actually a RW uh, rewrite lock. So when you, you know, if you have a thousand threads on RT and say they all fault. We were serialized because the thread, uh, the, the fault grabs the uh, MX and that for read, but because all readers are a single block now, it's just like okay, you block, you block, you block, and that's one of the performance hits that we're trying to deal with right now is because a lot of people are saying they're running these real-time Java. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that's an oxymoron to me, <laughs> but they run in which Java just. Creates threads as a license to create threads. And I think I ran like a Hello World and I counted like 10 threads that were created from Hello World. <laughs> and it was just weird. So there are all these threads, and now because they're all faulty like crazy, 
And it's just like that start the application, like this is huge. Like the, the machine just stops. One time they thought it was a deadlock, like what? And I looked at it, 5,000 threads doing, you no, know, and they're all false and like crazy. And I was like, oh, okay, there's a problem there. <coughs> no hertz. Um, no hertz is great for power management. Uh, that's why I'm bringing this up because one of the things about no hertz is, you know, it causes, if you, the whole idea of no hertz was when your system goes idle. You want it to get to the deepest sleep possible to see the If you're not doing anything, and you have this timer interrupt that's going to take a take, take constant waste of the CPU, doesn't work, it looks like a waste of the CPU, it doesn't work, it looks like a Every CPU has a little take right off for scheduling. But if you're an idle, you're not scheduling, there's no reason. So we created, uh, built this, you know, people in the real time actually are working on this to make, um, but when you go into idle, turn off the clock. Now you can sleep, and now you're not going to have an interrupt for it. If you don't have any devices going on, you're not taking the keyboard, you don't have any users, your machine's just sitting there doing nothing. The CPU can not go into a real deep state and sleep really well. And this is great for power management. But if you're on a real-time system, it sucks. It's not, it's not undeterministic, it's balanced because you can measure it, but this is something people forget about this. Like, I want, you know, 10, 10 microsecond latencies on Max, or 50 microsecond latencies. Sometimes they get out of that deep slate, it's going to be like a few hundred microseconds to get out of these deep slate. So they'll, the machine will be idle, and all this work will come in like, whoa, why did I miss my deadlines? Well, because you're, you have no perks on it. You know, I hate to say this, but you know, idle equals pole is probably your best bet. It will just up the AC credit. But also, <coughs> what, one of the things we're doing is we want really bad is isolated CPUs, where you could run a test. Now, a single process running is equivalent, it's just like idle running. There's no reason to have a tick when it's a single process scheduled on a CPU. There's no scheduling limit on You know, if you call schedule, it's going to say, okay, who am I going to pick? You. Who am I pick? You. Who am I pick? You. I mean, it's, it's, there's no decision making. It's one person or one task. Like, who cares? So, why have a tick? So, we're, there's lots of things that depend on the tick right now that we're trying to fix and get rid of. There's a lot of work that we're doing right now at the moment. So ideally, this is actually really good for real time. So you can say, put a process in there and just let it go. I mean, and it's good for for CPU bound. Yes. Anything that's uh, processing anyway. It's good for throughput. There you go. Something that's real time that's good for throughput. <laughs> yeah, HPC people will love us for this. Um, I threw this slide in at the last minute because I realized in my abstract they said I talked about real time user space and I'm like, oh shit. Um, sorry. Don't use Rhino 99. Your test is probably not the most important test in the system. Even though you really think it is. Come on, if you're looking at all your systems, use 89 or something like that. 99 just causes <coughs> problems. Um, don't re implement your, a spin lock in user space. People do this all the time. They just like, oh, I found that. I don't want to schedule off. Futex is made for me, by the way. Uh, Futex is actually a user space bin lock. It will actually, or yeah, it will like M map, M -map like two tasks that are running will share the same memory, and the Futex will actually look at, it won't do a system call if there's, so there's, unless there's contention, unless you actually do block. Um, has there been an adaptive uh, Futex system? I think we were looking at trying to do that. What I mean, the the oh. the RTU, the the, if we go into the kernel and block, then the Oracle yeah, UTX code but, is doing the adaptive thing. Yeah, well, we're trying to do it for user space. Yeah, I, I looked at it, but it hasn't been. Hasn't yeah, been it's, okay, what, just so I explain what adaptive um, uh, music is. Uh, the, the spin locks are converted to real time music, or the spin locks are converted to music is in um, real time, though, this is adaptive music. When you block on a spin lock or music, instead of just going right to sleep, you check, is the you know who the owner is? You say, is the owner running? If the owner is scheduled on another CPU running, there's a good chance that it's going to release its lock really soon. Don't go to sleep. Spin, you can still be preempted. It's not like you just like a preemption direction. <laughs> another task wakes up and preempts you, and you can stop the spin. But you can actually spin waiting for this guy to release the lock. If that guy goes to sleep, then you go to sleep. If the guy releases the lock, you grab the lock. This it does is really quick for performance and it's really well. That's, and we're trying to do implement the same thing in user space as well. So, but we do that actually going to the kernel. We do that, but we don't do it actually. Do you see how it's called an adaptive lock, but all it does is spin a hundred times? Yeah, but uh, that's so the yeah. first stuff. The problem is in user space, you have no idea whether the other guy is running or not. Right, it's a lot harder than the simulation. We're putting that in like the local storage. Yeah. So there, there's some security issues because you're 
expose information about kernel state. So there is any objection yet from more about that, but and you never get consistent state out of here, so yeah. it's, it's, well, it's saying, pointless. Uh, well, this probably, uh, probably may seem difficult, but they didn't even set a attribute in uh, the kernel where it says, you know, if I'm going to go to sleep, look at all my, the locks I'm calling and set a bit. That's saying I'm going to sleep or something. You know? But only if you ask for that. You know? We have this one we talk about yeah. later. But, um, you know, if you're doing your real-time task, your real-time task, if you have people say, wow, my real-time task is like having problems here. I'm like, well, you're actually the file system. You know, don't do that. To put up to a thread, you can do stuff, share some data back and forth, because that has something that's, you know, not in real time to do I.O. Um, like an MAP SC data, do something like that. You set a lot of all for, you know, because you have to realize that if you're going to access something in the user space that if you fault to hit, you take the hit for faults. Be aware for that, measure that. Just some ideas about uh, what to do with user space. Uh, but questions? Shared interrupt, and you see that um, I always have to have a device handler. For mainline, if you want this to be threaded, well, okay, if we say thread everyone, we will, we will, it will be a thread. It'll just everyone will be sharing the thread. So all, so when, and we'll no, it's still thread. separate threads. Oh, do you still separate? That's right. Yeah. You, do. you still, you still, but no, you have what? But well, you still have to wake them up. Yeah. We, all so, so when we full thread them. Then what we do is basically disable the IRQ line itself, yes. wake all the threads, and, and when all the threads up. return uh, and the, the running thread count goes to zero, we re-enable the line. So yes, if you do it on purpose on with a with a device which runs in hard interrupt context and one which wants to have thread, <laughs> then you have to have a primary handler which basically uh, disables the interrupt source in the device itself, and then wake your thread. So the other, so you're not you're not blocking the other device device on the same shared line from handling an interrupt. So and then when your thread, re the thread at the end of the thread handler, you re-enable it in the device and magically things work. So what you have question about the Oh, we must have the buffer, they're both in So we must have the idea. Well, what you, you could get whatever you want to do. It's, it's mostly used in, for drivers which <coughs> are bound to I2C yeah, and stuff so like right. that yeah. today. Well, yes. Uh, for the jitter for what? The running of the thread or the interrupt itself, yeah, you can't stop that. You know, we, when hardware comes in, we have to handle the hardware in So there's a little jitter right there. That's the back of my one slide there. It's that that's it's that's the jitter right there. Well, the hardware interrupt comes here and the race of the And if you, if also if you do ISO CPUs, you can move off your interrupts from another CPU and run your real-time task on one CPU and have this thing run on another CPU, so we actually, this jitter could be on another CPU. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If, it's, if the kernel internal stuff is higher priority, yes. But if, you have, if your user space is really high, there's still things that come in that um, there are things that are currently happening. Right now we're working on an ISO CPU where we can say disable everything, all interrupts that or anything that has to be done within the kernel and let this guy run uninterrupted at all. Uh, but yes, if for all the tasks or kernel threads, you can make your task higher than all the interrupt numbers. Uh, the migration thread, something that's scheduled onto that same CPU, the migration thread is at 99, it will wake up and it will be 22 if you want because that's how it moves tasks around.
It's at 150. Oh, it's above 99 now. I'm sorry. Nothing would be higher than my. If you say 99, I guess that will still be issued. Final question. How do you see this I mean, cinema has the same problem. You have to deal de with hardware de interrupts as well, so it's not different. So you have the interruption by an, by an incoming hardware interrupt, but even on cinema, you just yeah. hand the deferment is handled differently. So and if you look at, at comparison numbers between preamp RT and cinema, um, it's roughly in the noise of measurement by now. The only difference is that if you run cinema in anything larger than full course, it will come to a grinding halt. But PMRT <coughs> does not because we, we, we utilize all the S&P work which we have in the kernel. So you're basically saying that um, this PMRT uh, sooner or later will replace the need for cinema. I think so, yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean you, you, you gain not much more with Xenomai, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's in the few microseconds noise range where it's probably a little bit faster than RT still in some benchmarks. Uh, but it loses, especially on large S&P systems, because it's a global run queue, which doesn't scale well if we go above a certain number of CPUs, we know that. Um, and the other thing, it doesn't provide any other uh, separation. Like if you talk to the to the, the hardcore RT guys, they want to have temporal and sport uh, isolation from the things. But Cinema does provide it to still run in the same in the same address space without further protection. So Thank yeah, you. I think it's going away. Yeah. Just uh, in terms of the board, do we have any sort of like a Besides the working threads, no, 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 no. That's a massive problem if you want to use burn fuse in your high in your high priority yeah. devices. Don't do it. What should you do? Just convert them, convert them to something else. Use your use your use your handler and, and yeah. do the work with it and control it. So if you have something that you care about that uses a work queue, submit a patch to preempt RT that does either the, either this or actually you could get it mainline as well. Okay. <coughs> if you could do RCU, um, yes. If you could convert real, uh, essentially RCU would benefit uh, mainly because you would get rid of the cache time constant. And RCU works great for uh, public committees or other real estate. Yeah, uh, most of the reader write logs actually are gone. Yeah. So still, yeah. network stack has a huge amount of reader write logs, which were a massive pain in the neck. <laughs> and uh, they. And uh, MFSAM is a reader write the semaphore. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a huge pain as well. Uh, but it's not only a huge pain for RT, just RT accelerates the problem. Yes. Um, so, but in the network stack, most of the, the reader writer logs have been replaced by RCU. RCU is a classic replacement for reader writer logs where you do not care about the, the temporal snapshot, but you care about the correctness of the snapshot itself, the consistency of the snapshot. So, that's basically the guarantee you get from reader writer logs as well. Well, what Thomas just said too, I just want to point out the point about the acceleration. A real most of these problems exist in mainline, but we just accelerate it. Uh, because what happens is we we actually made mainline links go to multiple CPUs much better because we were able to find, we were able to do all the bugs way back when when you know most of you afford was four CPUs at max. You know, that's the big machine four CPUs, wow. Well we were finding those things because with Preempt RT, uh, every task is basically a CPU. So if you have a thousand tasks, you're actually running on any possible system. It's almost like you're going to hit the same problems as a thousand CPU with Simux. So that's actually what's happening. If you put in like 5,000 tasks in a real time system, you're going to hit everything you have for 5,000 CPUs. So we actually define those bugs on a small system that 
the helped out mainline when they actually got to this whole policy in 96 years. Yeah, and they are massively complaining about MEMAP then. Yes. See, yes, things like that. Because MEMAP set was because of the cash line policy <coughs> on 4,000 CPUs, that brings everything to a grinding out. You are now serializing the system again, just like real time does. So we actually just we simulate huge monster machines for, on like one core. Any other questions? Yes, RC is fully preemptible. It's even preemptible right now. Yeah, yeah, it's even preemptible. We have preemptible. What's the role of software IPs? Oh, software IPs. Um, there's still roles, there are roles that make our lives pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> no, we are actually having some things that. Um, if you went to Thomas' talk, he talked about the software IQs where you can actually skip running calling them or actually having the thread call the software IQ handler directly itself. If there are bases, when you do a raise of software IQ, it's this little flag when you uh, say new local bottom half enable, it will check say, oh, did you raise something? Yes, I did. Call the handler for it. So it doesn't even go to the software IQ, it just actually, whoever raised the thread will actually run that process. Um, and it can grab locks that will, if the other one has priority hands as well. I have some vast get rid of the network software IQ completely out of my mind. Uh, that's coming up hopefully in the near future. <laughs> so that's our idea is also there because they hate them, but we actually have tricks to actually avoid waking up we have waking up the case case of their community thread. So right now we have a case of their community that does all software IQs, but instead if you raise one and then it will actually try to say, okay, but this if he raised it, let him do the code. Yeah, which is fair. <laughs> I mean, so, in the context which raised the problem and not uh, some random victim. Right. So, and uh, what about a sequence? What? A sequence? Oh, sequence? There's only a few of them. Well, we actually have a very great sequence. Yeah, but it's... Uh, don't use them. It's one of those things that we have to figure out how to get to me on yes. Any other questions? No, sequence, sequence locks are, are key below the key. Thank you very much.